Hi there. Thanks for tuning into the Freedom Update. I'm Christine Van Gogh with the Canadian Constitution Foundation. And today I want to talk to you about the Charter at 40 years old. April 17th is the anniversary of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I want to have a look at how this part of our Constitution is perceived by the public and by the government it's designed to constrain and how good a job it's been doing at protecting our rights. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Christine Van Gogh and I'm the litigation director for the Canadian Constitution Foundation, a Canadian legal charity that fights for fundamental freedoms in Canada in the courts of law and public opinion. I upload regular videos about our ongoing cases and other, uh, other interesting constitutional developments. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, please hit the like and subscribe button below. It really helps my videos out a lot. And please remember that my videos are not legal advice. If you have your own legal question or problem, please consult your own lawyer. So happy birthday to the Charter, which is turning 40 years old. In human years, 40 is still pretty young, and I don't want to hear otherwise. But in terms of constitutions, it really is a very young document. The CCF's executive director, Joanna Barron, has written a recent article in The Hub where she gives a good look at the Charter and how it's been perceived by the public and by governments and how good a job it's been doing protecting our rights, especially in the last three years in the context of COVID. I'm going to link to the article below in the description, but in today's video, I'm going to talk a lot about the themes and the issues that Joanna outlines in that article. As a little bit of a constitutional law 101, the Charter sets out the rights and freedoms that are necessary in a free and democratic society. If you've never read the Charter, you really should. You won't be able to protect and defend your rights if you don't understand them or know what they are. And at the Canadian Constitution Foundation, we actually have a free online course that you can take about our fundamental freedoms. You can sign up at the ccf.ca slash learn. But in case you haven't taken the course yet, the Charter sets out a number of rights, like, for example, the right to free expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom of religion. It sets out our democratic rights, like election around elections and voting. It sets out your rights on arrest, detention, or search. It sets out your right to uh, life, liberty, and security of person, your mobility rights, the right to enter, remain in, and leave Canada, your right to a a speedy trial, and our right to equal treatment under the law, among others. Now, the Charter is a part of our Constitution, the laws containing the basic rules of how Canada operates. And the Constitution is the supreme law of Canada, and all other laws must be consistent with the rules set out in the Constitution. If they aren't consistent with the Constitution, they aren't valid law. Now, as I'm sure many of you know, our rights guaranteed under the Charter are not absolute. They can be limited under Section 1 of the Charter if that limit is demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. And what that means, the test for when a limit is justified, it's called the Oaks test and it was developed by the courts. There is a lot more to it. I really recommend taking our free online course to get a more detailed look at the Charter and these rights and how they can be limited, but that's what I'm gonna sort of say at the high level. So with all of that background, let's look at some recent instances where the Charter was at play in the COVID context. In April 2021, Doug Ford acted out of desperation to tamp down on a surging third wave of COVID in Ontario. He announced the pandemic's probably most draconian measure to date a stay-at-home order backed by an eye-popping new police power that would enable cops to stop any person in the province and demand proof of their reason for not being home. Most of you will also probably remember what happened next, that more or less every local police force in the province announced that they would, uh, you know, not be implementing this new policy as it was overbroad and presented the risk of disproportionately targeting communities and de demographics that were already subject to over-policing. Uh, the one exception to that was the OPP did say that they would be enforcing it. Now, the policy was a blatant violation of our Charter of Protected Rights against arbitrary arrest and detention, as well as the right against 
uh, unreasonable search and seizure as it would have given the police license to detain individuals for the mere reason of being outside of their homes um, without any other reasonable suspicion. So while Cabinet was discussing the merits of that policy, its likely unconstitutionality was actually raised by the Attorney General Doug Downey. Ford's cabinet must have known that the order would be subject to charter challenges brought by civil liberties groups, which immediately the CCF included, uh, issued press releases. But it looks like cabinet probably figured by the time any challenge made its way to the courts, the enhanced police powers would already have been revoked. In that instance, Ford and his cabinet's apparent view that charter rights are for politicians to freely sidestep and, and leave to be adjudicated later by the courts is a real misunderstanding of the intention of a constitutional framework, and it shouldn't be tolerated 40 years after the adoption of the charter. But the federal government hasn't fared much better. It turns out that Justin Trudeau and his so-called charter party, uh, the charter was introduced by Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Justin Trudeau's father, well, it turns out that those current liberals aren't more assiduous in their regard for themselves as being bound by the limits of constitutional rights either. Despite lip service practices like instructing the Department of Justice to conduct a review and affix a charter statement to new legislation. The Trudeau government invoked the Emergencies Act despite both border crossings and the Ottawa occupation being effectively cleared under normal police powers. In invoking the act, Trudeau also brought in economic measures, which it's not hyperbolic to say, took a wrecking ball to well-established rights against unlawful search and seizure and privacy by permitting banks to freeze accounts of otherwise law-abiding citizens who might have donated to the convoy. This was permitted under the Emergencies Act without court order, and it was insulated from civil liability. You would expect such a gobsmacking announcement like that one under the Emergencies Act to at least make reference to consideration of how the attendant violation of charter rights could be justified. You know, clearly the Liberals were well past the point of bothering to rubber stamp the policy with a, a charter statement in that case. Everybody knows that a warrant is needed prior to a search and seizure of private property. But Christia Freeland referred only to consulting with banks. In a press conference a few days later, the Prime Minister admitted to some ambiguity about whether his invocation of the act was justified, but welcomed court challenges that have already been filed. A constitutional democracy requires that all actors assume that they are bound by the foundational rules of the game. Professor Gregoire Weber has written in support of the responsibility of Parliament in promoting and constructing the meaning of rights in dialogue with the courts. And to quote his paper, the first and most important responsibility for protecting, respecting, and promoting rights rests with the government and Parliament. Safeguarding rights is not the sole responsibility of courts. Parliament also has a role and shouldn't be enacting legislation in direct violation of our constitutionally protected rights. It stands to reason that a robust constitutional culture requires all three branches of government, that's executive, legislative, and judicial, to see themselves all as active in preserving a culture of constitutionalism. Legal commentators, including those of us at the CCF, have been critical of the role of the Supreme Court as a roving law commission and as a super legislator in the charter era. This was especially true during the days of McLaughlin's court from 2000 to 2017, perhaps reaching its peak with Rosalie Abella's notorious determination in a 2015 decision overturning a two-year-old precedent on public sector unions' right to strike. Joanna lays out in her article in The Hub that there are some indications that the current Supreme Court has retrenched from a posture of outright judicial activism and turned towards a more textually rooted approach. Essentially, uh, judges are bound to apply the law as it's written and intended and can't make law. However, when the executive branch fashions itself as able to act free from the strictures of charter rights and awaits a final determination of whether it acted out of bounds from the courts, well, that leaves a disproportionate burden 
of enforcing the charter to the courts and encourages strident judicial activism in the name of a sort of rebalancing. It's the legislatures and the executive, not courts, who are best positioned to specify exactly what the contents of rights are. They're in the business of directing bureaucrats, dealing with police forces directly, consulting with constituents, and creating proportionate responses. Judges, after all, are cloistered and removed from the real world impacts of their decisions. They can't carry the full burden of charter ownership. As the charter arrives at its uh, middle age with its 40th birthday, it's time that Canada become a mature constitutional democracy where all public actors see their power as being circumscribed by rights. But the public also has a role to play here. I have called repeatedly for the need for a stronger civil liberties culture in Canada. That starts with public education, as well as support for civil society organizations like the Canadian Constitution Foundation. So talk to your friends and neighbors about the need for a protection of our fundamental freedoms. You can also stay up to date with all the ways that we at the CCF are fighting for fundamental freedoms by signing up for our freedom update emails at the ccf.ca slash freedom update. And of course, by subscribing to this YouTube channel and ringing that notification bell so you never miss one of these updates. And while I don't want to push too hard for this course that we've developed, I just want to say it really is such an incredible resource and it's totally free and it's right at your fin fingertips. It will help you to speak in an informed way about our rights. It's taught by some of Canada's leading scholars and practicing lawyers, and the material is really worthy of a law school class but it's taught using language that's accessible to anybody. So if you do end up taking our free course, please tag me on Twitter at cvangine and let me know that you've registered and I'll give you a retweet. So sort of to sort of to wrap this up, I do think that the charter matters. I do think there has been a very serious erosion of rights in the last three years, but I do have a lot of faith in civil society, in us, in members of the public, in pushing for our politicians to do a better job uh, because they really have not done a, a good job in the last three years. I think that we need to push for our politicians to have better respect for our rights, to leave less of this to the courts and to demand better from our elected leaders. Okay, that's all for this update. Thanks for tuning in and let's keep fighting for freedom in Canada. Okay.